calls on mute, uh, with the exception of our presenter. And we're just going to have a few opening remarks. So good morning, everyone. My name is Sue Ling Ting, and it is my honor to be the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning for and a conversation about uh, our Ottawa, what we're going through today and how we're going to press forward into the future. Um, I would like to recognize some of the members of our Board of Trade, Board of Directors who are joining us here this morning. Uh, thank you very much to um, the following people for their <clears throat> leadership um, of the business community through their work at the Board of Trade, to uh, Ian Sherman, Shelley True, Craig Bader, Amanda Lynn Smith, Lynn Johnston, and Wayne French. So thank you very much for your support during this time and for being here. I would like to especially thank our political leaders and our presenters here today, Mayor Watson and Minister Fullerton. We are very grateful to you for making the time to join us and knowing how <clears throat> your demands are uh, very, uh, deep these, these days, so we appreciate you being here. And we're really pleased to be able to facilitate this discussion given the ever-evolving <clears throat> situation and its impact on our economic, our physical, and our mental health. As the voice of the business in Ottawa, it's our mission to create prosperity through advocacy, collaboration, and leadership. And we want to recognize all of our stakeholders, including our guests here here today, many of whom are volunteers, active volunteers for the Board of Trade. Thank you to our public officials, to our business leaders, and, um, and to everyone in our business community who's working hard together to mitigate the impacts of this COVID-19 and ensure that we are living in a safe and economically thriving environment. So for today's agenda, we're going to have a few opening remarks from our uh, guests, our esteemed guests, followed by a moderated q and I know many of you did submit uh, questions ahead of time, and we thank you for that. Um, if you have additional questions that you would like to submit, you can do that through the chat, and our own Lynn Ladd is going to monitor that for us. Um, I'm sure many of you are very proficient on Zoom these days, but just in case, um, there is a view at the top, a speaker view that you can have of just the speaker or the gallery. And we love seeing everyone's faces, so thank you very much for those of you with the video on so that we can um, be connected in some way. Um, also, just so you know that the, uh, the um, event is being recorded, and with that, the uh, chat is also recorded, both the private and the everyone. So I'll just let you know that um, just for your own information. So um, I'm going to start by introducing both of our presenters and then opening it up to them. But uh, I'm very pleased today to have the leader of the City of Ottawa, Mayor Jim Watson here. Uh, Jim was elected um, Mayor of the Amalgamated City of Ottawa in 2010 and re-elected for a third consecutive term in October 2018. He's dedicated most of his career to public service in Ottawa, Canada's capital. He was first elected as city councillor in 91 and again in 94 and became the youngest mayor in history in the old city of Ottawa from 97 to 2000. In 2000, he was appointed president and CEO of the Canadian Tourism Commission, a position held until 2003. And then from 2003 to 2010, he served as an MPP and minister in, in Ontario before returning to municipal politics. He sits on several boards, including the NCC, the NAC, and Invest Ottawa, and has been recognized for his support of the tourism industry named uh, Ottawa's Tourism Leader of the Year in 2012. In 2016, he was presented with the Water Leader Award by the Ottawa Riverkeeper for his persistent leadership to prioritize city efforts to clean up the Ottawa River. So thank you for being here, Mayor Watson. Our second presenter today is Dr. Marilee Fullerton. Uh, Dr. Marilee Fulton is a medical professional who has spent her career helping people in her community. Today, she is our MPP for the riding of Canada Carleton. In June 2019, she was asked by the Premier to serve as Minister for Long-Term Care. Uh, before that, she was served in the Cabinet as the Minister for Training Colleges and Universities. She's a graduate from the University of Ottawa Medical School and has practiced locally first 
uh, serving out of the Carlton Place. We might ask everyone just to mute until we're until we're through. Um, and has been very active in professional medical associations and local healthcare associations, including advisory roles with both the Ontario Medical Association and Canadian Medical Association and membership in the City of Ottawa Board of Health and the local Lynn, serving the Ottawa area. She is a constant advocate for better universal health care services, particularly long-term care. She is a wife and mother, raising three children in a busy Canada household with her husband, Steve, of 34 years. Between her active family life and her career as a family physician, she has always made time for volunteering with neighborhood groups or her children's recreational activities. With her extensive professional credentials and her passion for community, Mara Lee is recognized as a strong, positive voice for the residents of Canada Carleton. So thank you for being here today, Minister Fullerton. So I think maybe what we'll do, Jim or Mayor Watson, is open up with your uh, comments, if we would, and then followed by Minister Fulton. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sue Ling, and thank you and Ian and the Board of Directors uh, for orchestrating and organizing uh, this town hall meeting. And thank you, Minister Fullerton, for, for being with us as well. And uh, my congratulations to you and the Premier for the great work that you're doing, uh, helping us through some very difficult times in our city and our province in the country's uh, history. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Sue Ling very much because she's an active member of our economic task force, which still meets every 10 days or so to share specific concerns about uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, the impact it's having on particularly the small business community. At the city, we have struck an economic recovery working group made up of staff from several different departments who are currently assessing measures that will help small business recover in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we'll start uh, announcing some of these initiatives shortly, starting with our business reopening toolkit, which will, unveil, will, which will be unveiled next Wednesday. The toolkit is a comprehensive roadmap that will help small businesses plan their safe reopening with everything from managing supply chain management issues, protective uh, equipment orders, and staff contingency plans. This will hopefully help many small businesses reopen with the right measures in place to ensure the safety of their employees, clients and customers. Uh, the week after, likely on the 29th, the city will host a town hall uh, where we'll present and outline our recovery plan in order to seek your input before bringing it to council for approval. I'll hope that you'll join us in good numbers and I look forward to getting your feedback. We'll make sure that Sue Ling and the Board of Trade make sure they have the information so that we can funnel it out to all of uh, the members of the board. The city is also continuing to support area retailers and restaurants with a social media campaign that encourages uh, residents to both buy local and support local. Phase one of our buy local campaign generated more than 13.6 million impressions and resulted in over 55,000 visits to the buy local page on ottawa.ca. If you haven't seen that page, I encourage you to go to ottawa.ca buy local slash buy local. This is hopefully helping the garden centers and hardware stores that are uh, opening again, as well as all non-essential retail stores that were allowed to begin opening curbside to pick up and delivery this past Monday. And then, of course, the Premier announced more openings just yesterday. These businesses have been uh, forced to close for almost two months. and They can finally start serving their customers once again. Nous devons faire des efforts spéciaux pour aider à nos commerces et nos restaurants qui peuvent finalement réouvrir. I'm also proud that uh, most members of council and our city staff are pulling together to help our residents and businesses get through these difficult times. At council on Wednesday, I, was, I came to the defense of merchants in McLeave, for instance, uh, whose councillor was trying to roll out a plan to remove parking on three blocks on Bank Street, just when the province announced curbside uh, pickup was, uh, was permitted. Thankfully, the majority on city council supported a motion I brought forward with councillor Laura Dudas to stop this plan that would have jeopardized the livelihoods of small businesses and their employees in our fight against COVID-19. Uh, this issue came to my attention last week and I want to thank the Glebe Business Improvement Area. They managed to get in just a matter of 24 hours over 30 letters and emails into my office that I was able to raise uh, at council, let members of council know how serious this issue was in their community. Uh, Glebe residents already, as you know, have many different options to get around, including the opening of Queen Elizabeth Driveway uh, next to the Rideau Canal. But we want to make sure that when uh, more businesses are allowed to open, we're rolling out the red carpet to allow this to happen and not red tape. 
So I was very pleased uh, that we were able to uh, help that uh, segment of the small business community. And um, I thank my colleagues on council for that and those local businesses uh, who were very much concerned about um, their livelihood. Uh, in many instances, these businesses have had no revenue for the last two months and they're struggling just to survive. So I thank again the business community. Um, you know, we have a really good cross section of uh, people on our, uh, our business group, uh, the Board of Trade, uh, Ottawa Tourism Festival Network, Le Group de Champs d'Affaires. Uh, we've got uh, people from Invest Ottawa, of course, uh, Laura Dudas and Eli El Shantiri um, are also uh, sitting on it along with uh, Sue Ling and uh, many other organizations that are doing great work during difficult times to get as much information as possible to the business community that creates the jobs that allow us to provide the network of social services uh, in our community. So thank you again, merci beaucoup, and uh, over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jim. So, you know, it really is uh, an unprecedented time and I wanna thank uh, the Ottawa Board of Trade, Sue Ling, the board, and also her counterparts who are doing such tremendous work right now to keep providing accurate information, important information for the business community. And uh, I think I was talking to a few people over the last few weeks and how quickly it emerges that everything is about relationships. And so uh, more importantly now than ever before. So I appreciate everything that is being done uh, for our businesses. Businesses, small and medium, are the backbone of our economy. Incredibly important in Ottawa. Uh, even though some people think of us as a federal government town, uh, our businesses here are, are top in the world in many instances. And uh, also the ability of our, of our grassroots and our smaller businesses to prosper uh, depends on, on what we do as a community and uh, as a province. So a couple of the words that have come to mind since this pandemic started was uh, uh, vigilance and adaptability. And Sue, Sue Ling and I were just talking about that, how we're going to have to adapt, um, and we have, and how we will do that together. And so with COVID-19, um, it's a virus that the, the world has never seen before. And so the science, the evidence surrounding it is evolving. And we are having to change our, our business practices uh, to meet those, those demands. And of course, there was the lockdown, the state of emergency declared back on the, uh, the 17th of March. And uh, that has created a, a whole different realm of challenges, never ever be been seen before in our lifetimes. So we've had recessions, we've had dips in our economy. This is unlike any other we've seen. So our ability for our communities and our business communities to adapt and be vigilant at the same time is incredibly important. And every level of government uh, has to work together on this. It's And focus on getting our economy reopened. And there is no start button. You know, we didn't turn an off button. We did do the lockdown. It was necessary for health reasons. Uh, and health and the economy are so tightly connected um, that it needed to be done. And now we're reopening, and you've heard uh, the announcement by Premier Ford. We have to get back now to a new normal. There is no start button for the economy. Um, it's about opening up, being vigilant, uh, watching what happens to our, our numbers, our case numbers, and being prepared to dial that back if necessary. So there is no calendar that we're following. Um, it is a, basically a, a, a roadmap. Watch, see what happens, uh, take the best evidence, take the best expert advice, the scientific and medical advice, um, bearing in mind the economic imperative and business imperative that we have to gradually open up. And as much as people are depending on good, good health decisions, they're depending on good economic and business decisions. And that I'm so grateful for, to, uh, to Mayor Jim Watson for his leadership municipally, and uh, we really are all in this together. So I, I think of, you know, I guess the only province in Canada that really is an island is PEI. Um, you know, we're not an island here in Ontario or in Canada. We look around the world and we see what's happening um, to China's um, economy. And uh, they've been leading in this uh, process. We've seen COVID-19 have a, have a terrible impact there and other countries around the world. And now that they are emerging, you know, I, I, I picked out some numbers here. 
and uh, the world economy in the first quarter of 2020 shrank by 1.3 percent year on year. But within one month, uh, in China, indu industrial sectors are now operating at 90 percent of where they were in the last quarter of 2019. So they've been able to ramp up, and you know there's a talk about the 90 percent economy. And will we, will we get there in Ontario? Will we surpass that? How long will that take? But we have to learn uh, from other economies as well. But that 90% number, I think that is the good news. Um, and that's the, the, the good news variation. We know that what we're up against is an unprecedented challenge. And looking at the US, their GDP is 12% lower than last year. And China's uh, reduction was 10%. So uh, most alarming to me is that Chinese consumer spending on dis discretionary goods and services is down by 40% from a year ago. And retail sales are off by tw almost, well, a little more than 20, 20%, 20.5% year on year. So those are stark numbers. But again, going back to what I said earlier, part of what has happened is a result of the lockdown saying this is something that we have to do we have to safeguard the health and safety of ontarians and that has had repercussions they were necessary repercussions but now as we move beyond that how do we manage our economy and this is where it will be again of that vigilance following the chief medical officer of health and his recommendations in terms of testing and i think that's a key point um, that we understand how closely these things are related but we have to allow that flexibility for our business sector, provide them with the guidance um, that will allow them to be adaptable. And uh, in the, the Economist, a uh, poll in the US demonstrated that over a third of Americans believe that it will be several months before things get back to normal. And I mentioned earlier about the new normal. Uh, will we ever get back to the old normal? That's hard to say, but you know, things evolve and things change and, and people are adaptable. So they believe businesses may reopen, but people may not spend. And that speaks to the uncertainty that we're in right now. But, but people are adaptable, I think, as we can um, create more reassurance that um, the economy will start moving, that businesses can open, um, that we will bring back that certainty. And it may not be the way it was before, but it will be a, a new normal, and that will be reassuring. So our government has been working on the recovery phase um, to capitalize on our local and provincial um, opportunities. And uh, you've probably heard finance um, minister Rod Phillips is chairing the Ontario Jobs and Recovery Committee, that is a cabinet committee. And Vic Fideli, who you uh, are all aware of, is vice chair of that cabinet committee. So we're working on policies and programs at the provincial level to make sure that workers have the support they need, families and, and businesses and that there is also a, a safety um, measures being taken to make sure that say, uh, businesses open in a safe manner with the best evidence. So incredibly important to support that level of, of certainty for people. Um, so as we head into the Victoria Day weekend, golf courses will be open. They have a, a different normal as well. Um, my understanding is that there must be social distancing and all the recommendations that will will lead out to other businesses, um, starting with the businesses that will be able to open um, in wider space, in the open air. And uh, we've heard some of those mentioned marinas, boat clubs, uh, boat launches, uh, ready for recreational use, private uh, uh, campgrounds uh, and parks. So this will be a start of um, our emerging economy. There is no start button for this. It will happen over time with vigilance and adaptability. And there'll be more details coming in the next few weeks as we go through the three stages. So thank you all for your interest. We're all in this together and uh, we'll get the economy going. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Fullerton, uh, for your comments. Um, I loved much of, we could almost wrap it up now. <laughs> that was a beautiful overview of what we're going through right now. Um, and I especially um, applaud this idea that we all have a part to play in this and that how quickly or slowly we move has a lot to do with how each of us as business owners and as citizens follow the guidelines that have been set out by our 
health officials. So we appreciate that. Um, so we have a question here for Minister Fullerton. Um, it is about long-term care homes in our province and wondering, um, is the government looking at wellness upgrades or new approaches or regulations for our facilities? So thank you for that. Now we're really looking at um, the redevelopment that was going on before this happened. So as soon as I was Minister of Long-Term Care uh, back in 2019, we began to look at the redevelopment that was needed um, after many, many, many years of neglect. And uh, that's a very important piece that the, the work was underway. Um, it is a standalone ministry now as of, uh, as of the summer. Um, I think I'm the only Minister of Long-Term Care in Canada, and that was the priority of our government, uh, looking at the 1.75 billion that was uh, already allocated to update long-term care, because we knew that the, the homes uh, needed uh, that upgrade. And so the facilities, whether they're seabeds, uh, or whether they're beds that need to be developed to uh, modern design standards. This was on the radar from the beginning, and that is a absolutely critical part, not only the building of capacity in long-term care, but also um, the redevelopment of the beds that needed to be brought up to standard. And, and we had been making strides in that, and I, I, um, I do believe that uh, the modern design standards, uh, they were um, uh, created back in about 2015 and there's been various efforts over the last number of years to make sure that those brought are, are brought up as we get more information but COVID-19 is a is a real new beast and so we have to really scrutinize what needs to be done in terms of, of any additional standards that might be brought to bear given the circumstances um, and uh, it's absolutely critical that we, we redevelop the beds that are, are not up to standard and uh, and understand the importance of doing that. So it's a huge priority. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor Watson, we have a question here from Marianne Lamb around the current status of the Club Link initiative to develop Canada Lakes. Um, have the timelines changed with respect to a resolution on this issue given the financial constraints faced by the city and its citizens? And do you expect that they will continue to develop this land? Yeah, I, I may have to ask um, uh, the minister for uh, partial assistance on this because um, the matter is before LPAT and LPAT, as you know, is um, uh, on hold uh, for as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the city uh, is very much uh, still opposed uh, to the proposal. We think we have a very solid case uh, with respect to the 40% uh, agreement. Uh, I want to thank uh, the minister and uh, the local MP, Karen McCrimmon, and certainly uh, Jenna Suds, who have worked very, very hard on this file. Um, this is really a matter of principle of protecting um, green space uh, that was uh, promised to the residents who paid a premium to buy homes that back onto the golf course and have paid substantial, um, st substantially more in taxes as a result of the value of their homes. So uh, the matter uh, still continues. The company can't uh, do anything until the matter is solved through the quasi-judicial process known as, as LPAT and uh, the city and the councillor and uh, the elected officials and that the community is uh, very, very united uh, in uh, their cause. And you know, people like Marianne Wilkinson, who was around when this deal was signed, uh, knows it very well and knows that uh, the, uh, the green space is very much appreciated by the neighbours because they bought into um, this community uh, with that uh, commitment. So I don't know, uh, Marilee, if you have uh, anything else to add, but you know, as, as I understand it, with LPAT on hold because of the pandemic, uh, this will eventually open up and uh, the matter will be before them. So, so thank you, Jim. I, I think part of it, um, as we look at the uh, court system and how it has had to adapt uh, to COVID-19 restrictions, um, there is the, the realm of possibilities in terms of virtual um, aspects to holding any hearings. Uh, largely this is uh, a municipal issue, but certainly understanding the, um, the LPAT uh, area, we may be able to do something with, um, with the virtual aspect uh, of holding these meetings. Okay, super, thank you. Um, Mayor Watson, since Parks Canada is starting to open historic sites in June, will city museums get the green light to open or at least have staff on site? Yeah, I, I would like to see that because these uh, museums obviously count on community support and visitor 
taxpayers to help them financially. Um, we take our direction, as you know, from the province. And when uh, those, uh, when we get that green light, uh, we would obviously work very quickly to uh, bring in the necessary procedures to ensure the safety of the employees and uh, as well as the customers, making sure physical distancing is still respected and so on. But we have, I think, about 10 amazing local museums that are located all throughout the city of Ottawa. And obviously they've been closed uh, since, uh, I guess, since the beginning of, of COVID-19, nine weeks ago. Uh, so, um, you know, we're uh, very much working as the minister indicated in a very positive collaborative fashion with all three levels of government. We put sort of partisanship aside and said, look at what's in the best interest of the community. And uh, as I said, when we get the all clear sign from uh, health officials at the provincial level and then Dr. Etches, who's doing such a great job for us here in Ottawa, uh, we will open those facilities, but they'll be opened uh, based on the regulations and the guidelines given to us by, uh, by the authorities that have that responsibility. But it's, uh, you know, the summer season is their big season, and uh, I know they had lots of plans for different activities. I noticed, for instance, in the news yesterday, there's uh, virtual activities at the Diefenbunker, for instance, in CARP. Tiffany knows all about that, uh, having covered it as a newspaper reporter. So it's, um, you know, it's obviously a great uh, asset. I know Dr. Fullerton knows it well because it's in her writing. And it's uh, doing virtual tours and uh, virtual activities, but nothing meets you know, beats the real thing. So uh, the sooner we get those open, the better. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, there is nothing that will help local businesses more than revenue. Will there be any focus on either uh, level of government to procure from local um, businesses and actually measure procurement in doing so? Is that to, uh, to I I Yes, well, you yeah, can, so thank you. Well, you know, I think we've been so focused uh, for the last few months on the health side, but obviously procurement um, is extremely important. And we look at um, how that can be made um, better. That's something that the Premier believes very strongly in, that our processes, the, the supply chains and the supply lines are extremely important. And if we look at um, the contributions that the public um, sector unions uh, might be able to offer in that regard, um, looking at uh, the, the processes that we might be able to use to have really everyone um, going in the same direction to make sure that our, our businesses can prosper and, and do well and shop locally. Um, that would be one aspect, making sure that we also uh, support businesses in, in understanding what their needs are. Uh, the procurement is one part of that, but it, it's, it's far greater than that. Uh, and I, I go back to the, the requirements for the guidelines um, the, uh, by the Chief Medical Officer of Health for, for our businesses to open. Um, and with our supply lines, it, it really will take um, a lot of time to understand where the gaps are, uh, looking at the, the way businesses can open and get the, the, um, the items that they need to run their businesses. But we really need everyone to be on the same page, and, and that includes um, what the public sector unions can do. Um, and certainly if we're looking at... Um, in terms of my sector, uh, looking at how we have even the educational um, uh, sector contributing, where people have not been able to work, where they, where they can be redeployed. Because maintaining the supply chain, making sure that our procurement is efficient as possible, that will allow our businesses to stay open um, as we go through this process. And it's incredibly important. And I, I really would encourage everyone to, to shop local, buy local, uh, that is important for our community here in, in Ottawa. Very good. Thank you. Mayor Watson? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Um, the city, in fact, does buy a good percentage of its um, goods and services and products locally because it's logistically the only way to do it. For instance, asphalt. You can't buy asphalt from you know, thousands of miles away or, or concrete. Uh, it has to be done locally. Uh, we're, we're restricted under provincial law from offering any kind of preferential treatment when we go out to procurement. Um, and some people argue, you know, they, they don't think that's a good idea, but we, we also don't want to disadvantage our companies, particularly in the high tech sector, that want to sell a product to New York City or, or Los Angeles because of protectionism and uh, you know, buy local um, policies. So uh, we're not allowed to do that. We have to go out and, and do an, an open 
tender. But as I said, uh, the vast majority, um, to the best of my knowledge, of these uh, contractors are in fact local because uh, we have to get the products uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, what we're also trying to do is to assist businesses through a tax deferral program that those companies that have had a very difficult time, and there are probably thousands of them here in Ottawa, small businesses mostly that have had to shut their doors and, and see their revenues go down to zero. Um, in fact, negative because they're having to pay rent. Uh, so the tax deferral program, we have now, I think, about a thousand people who have applied. If you go onto the Ottawa.ca website, you can uh, get information on whether you're eligible, the application process, and you're not cancelling taxes because obviously we need the money to, to provide the services to the public, but we can defer them from the payment in June and July uh, all the way to October. So it helps with hopefully some of the cash flow uh, challenges that people have been facing. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that the city's done a tremendous amount of work in supporting the buy local program. And that's, uh, I think that's been successful. But again, all of us have a part to play in that as well. I'm doing my part with the takeout in the local vineyards. So, <laughs> um, so with the built in um, resilience in Canada's largest technology park, Ottawa's tech sector has weathered and emerged numerous storms in today's environment. It is um, that resilience is critical. Many of the employers located in the tech park are relied on more than ever as essential services, covering subsectors such as connectivity, 5G, cybersecurity, the Internet of Things, uh, AV, and advanced manufacturing. In this current environment the, um, of the pandemic, we have shifted to remote work and collective reliance on their services have increased. What measures support? Um, in place, what measures are in place in order to foster continued innovation across the city and further resilience within our business community? And I think that's probably, we can start with you, Mayor Watson. Sure. Uh, well, we're going to be uh, releasing our, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, our toolkit uh, next Wednesday that will help those businesses that may have been forced to uh, shut down. Uh, we continue to work, for instance, with our, um, uh, our high tech sector uh, through the uh, autonomous vehicle uh, program at um, the research farm, along with the precision agriculture uh, program, which is important. Um, you know, the tech sector is actually... Um, Quite, um, it has been quite resilient, and um, you know, I, I talked to a number of the leaders over the last couple of weeks from the tech sector. Uh, we're feeling um, confident. I look at you know Shopify, for instance. Uh, they were quick to get everyone uh, home, uh, working from home, uh, and they are booming, obviously, in, in this economy. But we want to make sure that uh, that is available to everyone. Uh, phase three of LRT, for instance, will be uh, it's, it's down the road, obviously. Um, but it will be, I think, a game changer for Canada North Business Park, the high tech park, because it'll allow people to get uh, you know, living downtown, uh, working in the West End or vice versa. And uh, as I said, we're, we're continuing to uh, do whatever we can uh, to make sure that when businesses are coming back online, uh, that uh, we're not standing in the way of them actually prospering and, and doing well. I should, I noticed uh, Laura Dudas is on the line. I want to thank Laura and say hello. And I, I, I'm not sure if Eli's uh, on the line. I think he may be at another committee meeting. Uh, he's at uh, transportation, I believe. So thank you, Laura and Eli and Abstensia for uh, the work that you're doing um, to help us uh, get through this from an economic development point of view. And also to our staff, Steve Willis and his team, uh, Cindy and Ms. Kirk are doing great work um, as well. I want to thank them publicly. Yes, they are, Mayor Watson. Mr. Fullerton, anything about um, what the provincial government is doing to continue to foster sort of innovation and resiliency in the tech sector? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly right now, just uh, looking at the COVID-19 aspect, it's making sure that we have all the information available to support our, our businesses. Uh, there's a number of different websites that um, businesses can put information into as well for their innovations. Ontario Together is one of them. I believe there's been over 23,000 uh, submissions to that website. 
um, and to that group so that we can make sure we're, we're getting all the brilliant ideas uh, around the province. And particularly here in Ottawa, we've got the Canada North uh, Business Association and the, the largest tech park in, in all of Canada. And uh, I know they are a tremendous source of, of innovation and ideas uh, leading edge in, in many ways. And so that's one part. The other part is really a resource. And I can, I can get this, uh, the details of the websites from uh, my constituency staff to you. If anyone's interested, just please reach out to my office. Uh, more websites that provide the resources in terms of guidance and support uh, for our uh, companies as they move forward during this process of, of, uh, of re-emerging uh, to give them the, the support that they need. Um, and uh, I also want to do a, a little bit of a shout out to to all the companies that uh, have have really carried and been patient through all of this um, the last few months. Um, and uh, also Jamie Petten out in Canada, who is a, a real champion for the Canada North Business Association. But all the businesses who have have really been patient during this trying time, there are resources uh, for them. And uh, if they can reach out to uh, my office, we'd be happy to provide the, the, the proper links where you can go to merrilyfullerton.ca uh, and, and see um, those links on my website as well. The resources are there. We want to make sure that uh, companies have the, have the support that they need. Um, and uh, we will do um, whatever we can to support them in their innovation. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question from, I guess, a group. Uh, I have several questions that sort of fall under the same group um, of businesses that are affected by our inability to have mass gatherings and our expectation not to be able to have them for some time. So these businesses um, will not, you know, their, their revenues have dropped overnight and the expectation of them being able to uh, generate revenue in the foreseeable future is... Um, is lost and um, although they're not deemed in any way professionals or essential services, definitely many livelihoods depend on their ability um, to have events, including weddings and, and large scale events. So I guess in general terms, the question is, you know, can we see a way to support that group of, um, of businesses that are impacted by specifically our inability to have, not have mass gatherings? Thank you. So, we, you know, we're, with the, uh, the province under Rod Phillips, the uh, Ontario Jobs and Recovery Committee is constantly reviewing and hearing from uh, our communities. Uh, most recently, there was a discussion regarding, um, you know, weddings and how that should move forward. But this, mm -hmm. this is really something that is evolving and it will have to be combined with the, the best science and evidence we have in terms of, of the risks um, and the, the benefits because we know mental health depends on people being able to connect. Um, physically uh, as well as virtually mm -hmm. and and uh, if we talk about even bubbles when I think it's the Prime Minister in New Zealand who talks about bubbles and how those can be understood um, as we move forward and allow people to connect in a in a more controlled way um, and so your your group that you will connect with in one bubble may be able to interact with with another bubble um, but you would be potentially limited to um, to which bubbles that you can uh, that you can interact with. But it's another way of controlling the spread of COVID-19, and it is really essential to understand how that can be best done. Mm -hmm. um, so the science is evolving, and uh, and we will have more information from the, our scientific experts on that. Very good. Okay. I could just uh, offer a comment on that as well. Um, you know, some of the organizations, for instance, the Tulip Festival, are trying which is on right now, are trying to adopt uh, using technology and YouTube and uh, you know, uh, video shoots of the tulip beds so people don't have to go down to the tulip beds. Uh, but it's not the same thing. Obviously, people, you know, from, a, from a tourism point of view, uh, no one is coming to Ottawa and staying in hotels uh, to go to a tulip festival that really, unfortunately, uh, has been scaled back considerably because of the, uh, of the virus. So, you know, the, you know, while there's a lot of uh, frustration and sometimes anger and impatience about opening up segments of the, the economy, I think the province has taken the right, uh, steady, slow, cautious, and prudent and safe approach so that the last thing we want to do is to open up a sector too quickly and then we have to go back if it spikes with the virus and tell all those people, I'm sorry, you have to be laid off again. I think it would be pretty traumatic. So we're better to do it on a slower scale. I think you're seeing you know, some of the challenges that Quebec 
bank is facing where they make these announcements and uh, the public is not in step with them. So I think, you know, our premier and um, prime minister uh, are doing the, the right, right thing. There are a number of programs available at the federal and provincial level in terms of wage subsidies and rent subsidies that individual organizations and companies can apply for that at least helps them get through the, the most difficult period of time until they're able to open up and start providing the services to the various festivals and sporting events, for instance. You know, we, mm -hmm. we have a great uh, sporting community. We have 10,000 people that have registered for summer camps and uh, we can't give them the go ahead until we get the go ahead from, from the province and our health officials. Mm -hmm. And I think it has been encouraging to see how some of these um, events and festivals have been so innovative and in how they're, you know, moving forward, but also that there's been continued support from a sponsorship level as well uh, to help keep them going. So kudos to our, our business community for that as well. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions around recovery. Um, the ax I guess one question is is that we know that access to PPE will be an important part of our reopening and so from both the municipal and a provincial level you know what are we doing uh, from the government's perspective to ensure we have the PPP PPE <laughs> that we need and then also what can the business community be doing to support that so uh, I, it's a PPE. Who knew that that was in our vocabulary a year ago? Uh, it certainly is now. Everybody seems to know what it means, personal protective equipment. Um, and, and we've been um, challenged by that, uh, the, the global competition for PPE. Uh, all around the world, uh, countries are competing for the PPE. And you, you've probably heard the Premier say, we are um, going to be champions of a made in Ontario uh, solution to PPE. Uh, it is very important that, again, the directives and the guidance of the Chief Medical Officer of Health is followed in this as we open. Um, but there is um, lots of evolving science and evidence in this, but our, our government has been absolutely clear. We do not want to ever be dependent uh, on other countries for our, um, our, our PPE. Uh, and that, that uh, we have companies like um, GM who are retooling to make sure that they can manufacture um, millions of masks um, because we do really go through that, especially when we start to open up our hospitals for elective surgeries again. And so this is an absolutely critical piece, um, whether it's um, gowns, gloves, masks, uh, ventilators, uh, or other medical supplies. It's, it's, it's critical that we have a made in Ontario solution and uh, we have um, progress being made on that. Thank you. Um, Mayor Watson. Yep, sorry, I'm multitasking here. I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have obviously um, a lot of um, contact points with our staff and the public. We're very much a service-driven organization at the city. And so, for instance, we've been providing our OC transport and paratransport drivers with uh, PPE, and such as masks and gloves and so on. And we'll have to have that available, obviously, to a lot of the different organizations within the city of Ottawa. Um, you know, we've had some peaks and valleys in terms of when we've been very close to not having enough PPE, whether it be gowns or masks or, or gloves, and then, you know, shipment comes in. So, as the minister said, we're at, at the hands to a certain degree of a worldwide uh, demand and, and at times a worldwide shortage of certain types of, of equipment. And we want to make sure whatever we bring in from offshore is uh, safe and meets the high standards that Canada expects of its uh, of the suppliers for whether it's healthcare workers or frontline workers, um, you know we, we see uh, um, you know certain employees in, in certain businesses wearing uh, masks and others not. Um, I think our doc, our medical officer of health is encouraged us when you're going into you know shops like grocery stores and, and uh, uh, pharmacies and so on that you should wear a mask. So I've got a mask that I keep in the car and, and one I keep here in the office. Uh, it's often uncomfortable to wear, but you know, best medical advice is saying that it's it's uh, sensible to wear it so that it um, you know does as best a job as possible to protect uh, you from um, getting uh, droplets from someone else. As a mm -hmm. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. so we have um, you know we have supplies with our paramedics, obviously, with our police officers and firefighters, and um, we continue to work with the. 
provincial government that uh, acts as almost the, the wholesaler for us to get this material as quickly as possible. And as I said, we have never had an occasion where we've been completely out of uh, PPE. It's the supplies dropped uh, significantly from time to time, but it's been replenished. Right. May I may I add add to that? Um, just to say thank you. Um, I'm very very grateful to Dr. Vera Etches mm -hmm. um, for her good work, and also to the companies that have. Uh, been able to donate to to some of our uh, facilities that were in need of PPE and uh, that the government has created, uh, just as announced yesterday, the Workplace PPE yes. Supplier Directory mm -hmm. to help uh, get businesses the supplies um, that they need for PPE. Mm -hmm. So it is the Workplace PPE Supplier Directory. Yes, thank you for doing that. Uh, we, we can that a great resource and um, supply is one piece of the equation but there's a couple of other pieces if I could ask a follow-up question um, <clears throat> does can you foresee the province mandating the wearing of masks at all <clears throat> in the workplace or in public and also that there is a there is a feeling that there is that some resistance to the public at large necessarily adapting to wearing masks on an ongoing basis. Um, and has the um, either the province or the city considered what we can do to influence this? Um, as we know, it'll be a big part of the reopening. Yeah, so I, I don't mind jumping in here. In terms of the, um, the social distancing, so areas where the social distancing is, is um, adequate, then the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the public health officials mm -hmm. may deem um, the masking not to be required, but it really is determined on the ability to social distance. Now, there are people that are choosing to wear um, masks in public. Uh, we do know that countries who have done that um, and had good success and good uptake um, from the public on that. Um, right now, it is not mandated uh, by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, but certainly there have been recommendations if that you are not in an environment, if you are in an environment where you're not able to social distance, um, then you really do need to be wearing the, um, a proper mask. Uh, but this is something that we, we do need the public uh, support on going forward and it will be up to others to make those decisions, um, including our Chief Medical Officer of Health. Very good, thank you. Mayor Watson. Sorry, we're just getting some news that they may be opening the Quebec border between uh, Gatineau and Ottawa. There's an announcement later today, which will be great news, I think, for people who have been frustrated with that, that shortage. So I've been trying to, to deal with that while I'm, <laughs> I apologize when the minister was talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, there's no question in, in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the, the advice from our medical officer of health. Um, I, I think, you know, I've personally started to see, I was in the Glebe in Old Ottawa South uh, yesterday, I'm seeing a lot more people wearing masks. I think it's becoming much more comfortable for people to wear them and for people to see them being worn, uh, but there's still some reluctance. Um, you know, we know, for instance, some companies like Costco are now requiring their employees and their customers to wear masks, and you may start to see more and more of that in, in larger stores. And that's gonna have, uh, obviously, an impact um, on the bottom line of the store. Is the store gonna provide the, uh, the PPE, the mask for you? Um, they're going to lose business as a result of people turning away saying, I, I don't have a mask and they're going to shop somewhere else. So obviously a consistent uh, policy would make the most sense, uh, but we'll take uh, the advice from our, our medical professionals who, who know better than, than, than I and, uh, and others uh, when it comes to these decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've been well trained. It does not replace hand washing or, or physical distancing, <laughs> but it does, it does help. And I think it can... Um, a mass adaption of it, it would definitely uh, impact our economy for sure. <clears throat> um, one of the um, issues that have been on the minds of SMEs since the beginning of this pandemic is the ability to mitigate fixed costs and in particular rent. And we know that we were grateful to see a rent assistance program coming out a couple of weeks ago. And since then we have been able to provide and, and we thank the levels of government involved, uh, provide some feedback on um, what works well in the program and what could um, perhaps be updated or improved so, so as to fulfill the intention of the program. And so I just wondered if um, either of you had an update on on whether or not we can expect to see continued um, 
involvement in that program. So what we have done in Ontario is committed to $241 million uh, combined with the, the federal government to deliver more than $900 million in, in support uh, for urgent relief to small businesses and the, the splitting uh, of, the, um, of the cost between small business and landlords. So small business tenants and landlords would each be asked to pay 25% of the tenant's total rent. Uh, and the provincial and federal government would cost share the remaining 50%. So that, that's one area. Um, and looking at um, you know, how this would be administered by the um, uh, Canadian uh, Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And uh, it really is gonna take all levels of government to support our businesses. And this is one of the first things. It often gets um, shifted. So you may shift from the, from the tenant to the landlord and then the landlord's left left holding it and, and how do we balance all those needs so that everyone can come through this um, with as much support as possible so that when we reemerge that we have the, um, the locations and the structure uh, so that businesses can get going again. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just offer a, a comment. Um, obviously the city is limited in terms of what it can do financially. We're not allowed to, for instance, uh, assist a company financially. It's called bonusing and that's, that's prohibited under uh, provincial law. But what we did do was we offered the tax deferral program and we made it very clear to the landlords that if you're going to apply for this and benefit from a tax deferral that, that will save you, um, you know, paying your, uh, your property taxes uh, instead of paying in June, will be pushed off to October, you have to ensure that uh, your subtenants or your tenants, in fact, get the benefit as well so that they're not being penalized because we don't want to ha just help the large landlords. We want that to trickle down to help the, the mom and pop operations or the, the small stores or restaurants that happen to be on the first floor of a large building, for instance. So uh, we're being uh, very uh, precise in letting those companies know that have applied, that they have to also make sure that that uh, portion of the rent is deferred from uh, June of this year to October so that the small business operator will benefit as well. Very good, thank you. And, and one thing that we've realized working with our business community is that every tenant landlord relationship is so unique and that the programs are there to support, um, but that really it has to be a very transparent and good working relationship between the tenant and the landlord to make it work as well and create a win-win situation. So um, thank you, we'll continue to monitor that as we go forward. Um, I have a question here around sort of how we will manage our governments moving forward. So given the economic downturn and the associated decrease in tax revenue, um, does either level of government foresee themselves um, doing downsizing or pay cuts in order to mitigate uh, the, the countermeasures of COVID-19? Well, first of all, you know, this, uh, the situation has had an impact across the board. Um, where people are working um, remotely, uh, they are being productive. I think this is a situation where we want to keep people working and, and contributing and to uh, making sure that we can find solutions and keep government running. Uh, that's absolutely, absolutely critical that we, we do that. I'm back and forth to Toronto, but holding you know, 24 hours a day, it seems like uh, meetings seven days a week. Uh, and I know that, um, our, our public servants are working very hard to, to provide that. Uh, so this is something that we have to keep going, um, but we have to look at how um, everyone contributes and does their part. Uh, there is no doubt that, um, that people do need to be uh, continuing to work, whether it's remotely, and as we emerge from this, um, what process and what that looks like may be different. Thank you. Thank you. On um, the municipal side, obviously, the question about pay cuts, we have collective agreement that we respect, respectfully have signed with uh, our, our unions and associations and, and we'll respect those. We did lay off about 4,200 uh, so-called seasonal employees, people who are working in facilities that are no longer open to the public arenas, community centers, uh, swimming pools uh, and the like. And uh, we're redeploying some people from other departments, for instance, to be our park ambassadors that are, it's a program that's working very well in different parks around uh, the city to let people know uh, what, what is off limits and what is not off limits so that they can remain safe and healthy. 
Very good, thank you. Um, so there's a question here around clear guidelines for reopening. I think both of you have addressed that from both the provincial and municipal point of view. Uh, but I can just maybe emphasize that that is something that we hear a lot from our business community, that they, re they really need you know, clear direction on how to move forward through the reopening. And so um, I thank you both for that. But if you have more to, more to share on that piece around clear guidelines for reopening, I'd be, I'd be open to that. You know, we're, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Suling, we have a, a very good uh, toolkit that we're putting together and just finalizing now, and we believe that we'll be able to release that on Wednesday and uh, with my colleagues, uh, Laura and uh, Eli. And uh, it will hopefully answer a lot of the questions. We'll be able to answer all of them because every business and industry is a little different. But the general guidelines on how uh, a business can reopen uh, and other things that we're working on is you know, what can we do, for instance, uh, in the restaurant business, if there's uh, seating capacity issues, um, if the space is available, can we offer some kind of a, an outdoor patio uh, arrangement? So my office is looking uh, into that to see what we can do because that would uh, increase the, the capacity of, of the restaurant uh, and perhaps make up for the lost number of seats uh, inside, for instance. So. We're trying to be as helpful and as creative as possible at the same time respecting uh, the regulations and the guidelines that are that are uh, before us by the province or the federal government or our own medical officer of health thank, thank you. you thank you very good um one of the things that we know is going to be extremely important as we continue to move forward and i think in general that there is uh, support for the way that the province has has um, framed our reopening but building and ensuring consumer uh, workforce and business confidence is going to be a big part of that recovery and so my question to each of you would be you know what can each of your levels of government do to continue to uh, build that confidence as we move forward through the reopening and the recovery so thank you the um the first area really is surrounding certainty creating certainty i think that is is so incredibly important as we come out of this and how we will do that is, again, by making sure that the supports are available, that the guidance uh, for the, the public health measures are available, that um, the portals, so our government, our uh, businesses can reach out to governments, whether it's Ontario Together or to get PPE, make sure the communication is clear about how the guidance can be rolled out and what businesses have to do to keep um, their staff safe, to keep consumers safe. And, and to keep functioning. So providing that level of certainty, and again, that committee, the um, Ontario Jobs and uh, um, Re Recovery Committee will be absolutely critical um, for our businesses to understand that that is a mechanism um, by which uh, decisions will be made and uh, that we can follow the, the guidelines by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, um, making sure that that communication is clear. And if, if anyone needs to reach out to, uh, to my office, marylefullerton.ca, my website or my office, to get clarity or support on, on what they need, um, please do so. And uh, I also wanna um, make mention of the good work done by Councillor Jenna Suds mm -hmm. in, in my riding, um, because she has really been uh, very good at uh, staying in touch and keeping me updated, particularly around the, the golf course issue. And uh, I certainly support her and, and appreciate her efforts in that. So again, communication tools, communicating, and uh, making sure we value each other, uh, what we do at all levels. Very good, thank you. Mayor yeah. do you have anything to uh, add? I, uh, I concur with, um, with Minister Fullerton's um, sentiments, uh, 100%. Um, also, um, we, um, you know, before the, the, the pandemic, uh, reached our city and our country, the city of Ottawa was doing very well economically. Our unemployment rate was down to about 4.2, 4.3%, the lowest it's been in 30 years. Companies were hiring. There were, you know, some, something like two to 3,000 jobs that couldn't be filled in the, in the, um, the high-tech sector. So uh, my desire is to work with the business community to ensure that those companies that uh, do have openings, uh, we make sure that we connect the people looking for work to those uh, who have work as quickly as possible using whether it's Employment Ontario or uh, various business organizations uh, like yours, uh, Suling, uh, because you know, we were firing on all cylinders and uh, you know, we have uh, 
the most uh, knowledge-based economy on a per capita basis than any city in all of Canada with the highest number of engineers, and scientists, and PhDs. And so we want to take advantage of that and the great post-secondary network that we have with our four institutions here to ensure that um, we have the workforce and the, the jobs available to match them up. So you know, we're not going to get back to 4.2 or 4.3 percent overnight, but uh, I think we have a very solid basis to uh, to build from. And and even the fact that the fact that our largest employer uh, has not, for all intents and purposes, laid off uh, any large number of people, uh, they have revenue that's been coming in, and we're asking those people when stores start to open, buy local, go to your local restaurants, even buy now gift certificates. That's been part of our buy local campaign so that these stores and restaurants have some cash flow uh, in these difficult times before they're given the all clear signal by the province that they can open up. So I think, you know, uh, we're fortunate, uh, unlike a lot of other cities, that we do have that stable um, uh, environment of, of public sector jobs. And uh, we're hoping to use, not use those people, but encourage those people to go out and uh, use the services and uh, buy products of uh, local businesses because that will be a real shot in the arm for these individuals who in some instances may have to reduce you know in the restaurants for instance their their floor space and have more space between tables so they're going to have a, a bigger struggle to try to return to normal when they've lost half their seats if that's one of the requirements that, that will come out we don't know that yet mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor Watson. And we agree completely. Ottawa has a lot of unique assets that will position us to recover well um, from a high level. And so we look forward to continuing to work together with both of you. Uh, may I say during these unprecedented times, we also have seen unprecedented uh, collaboration and transparency and communication from, uh, from you, our leaders, and from many in our business community. And, um, and so we're grateful for that and we'll continue to count on that as we move forward through the reopening and the recovery. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much again for dedicating your time here with us today. And, um, and we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you and happy Queen Victoria Day. And thanks, Thank Queen Victoria, we're the capital of Canada. That's right. <laughs> Have a great long weekend. Take Thank care. you so Bye. much. Thanks for everything you're doing. Take Thank care. You, Minister. Thank you all for Thank you. Bye. -bye.